Welcome to the program, Michael. Thank you. You were in the Oscar-winning movie Cabaret, my all-time favorite, and the fabulously nutty Austin Powers. You've gone from drama to broad comedy. How tough is that to do? I love it. I, would, I think the one thing I'd hate would be to be stuck in a box or with a big label around your neck, you know, with a certain type. Yes. Um, and I think this is my own uh, instincts, you know. I, I've always, I, what I l love is the change in this job, that you're doing one thing one week and then you're doing something completely different. And maybe it's part of the training that we get in Britain, mm -hmm. at least I did, uh, in the 60s. There was still a strong repertory system yes. where you went off and learnt your craft the you know, Aristotelian way by doing it. Yes. So you're playing Shakespeare one week and a modern farce the next. And it was very, uh, gave you tremendous resources. And, uh, and I've always loved that. And I rather regretted that that didn't happen here. Um, in fact, I think it's very tough for young actors here, you mm -hmm. know, because in the first place, there's this huge um, concentration on celebrity, yes, uh, not on talent or you know, hard work, yes. but celebrity as yes. an end in itself. Yes, and I think that can be very damaging. Um, so you know, you see a lot of young actors who instantly become huge successes, but they have no resources to fall back on. Yes, they need those roots that are going to kind of hold them fast when the uh, when the, the chill winds start to blow, as they do in every career. Yes. I mean, you're in and out of fashion, you're hot and then you're not. It's just one of these inevitable things. Nobody rides the crest of the wave the whole, the whole time. trip. <laughs> no. Do you see statesmen on the horizon in, in our world today? Oh, yeah. I think they're statesmen. I think we have to celebrate them all. I think there's some very good people, you know, in politics today on both sides of the aisle. Mm -hmm. I think John McCain and Joe Lieberman, good, good or examples. you know, Senator Luger and former Senator Nunn, people who can work together mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. We should celebrate that more. And news people, you know, we talked about Crossfire. I remember mm -hmm. that was Pat Buchanan mm -hmm. and uh, Bill Press at one point and mm -hmm. all of that going on at, at CNN. But news people used to act as a truth squad. They didn't have mm -hmm. spin and now we have spin rooms and mm -hmm. analysts and and um, really opinion rather than fact. Remember Dragnet in the old days, just the truth ma'am, Joe mm -hmm. Friday said. Mm -hmm. How do we get back to reporting the news, to getting truth out there so people can make a, a decision and not just have all of these polarized decisions? You have really great newscasts on TV, like, you know, Jim Lehrer's newscast. Yes. And then there are times when you have things on cable that just really geared around shouting at each other, you know, a Bill O'Reilly or something. Right. And I think people have a free choice of mm -hmm. what they want to watch. And I think the more civil we are as a society, the better off we're going to be. And uh, sometimes I felt maybe I added a little bit to the incivility. And I hope there are times when I can push and say we ought to add more to the civility. It's what Ben Franklin taught us to do after 40 years of, you know, when he was in his 40s and he had been in the media his whole life, he said, you know, I've got to now dedicate myself to civility and civic institutions. And he sort of created a second career for himself. Yes. How did it begin? You know, I always go by Einstein's talent is 98% perspiration, 2% inspiration. Well, I think I do the 98 perspiration. I really work hard. I think, you know, I work really hard and if I aim correctly and get a little lucky, sometimes good things happen. So I yes. think really what happened to me when I was young was I was pursuing my dreams. And I think, you know, a dream is key to create the passion inside somebody to do something different, to grow, to try new things. And I think that remaining curious in your life allows that passion to be nurtured. How did this really happen? When you started at Columbia, what did you start as? I started as anything I could do, and that was really what I did do. I did everything and anything. And actually, it was the confluence of a lot of events that propelled me. You know, that was a time of great change, a sea change in the entertainment business. That was the time when 45-year-old men were playing 17-year-old teenagers, right. and women who were 60 were playing 24-year-old housewives. Right. And the audience was much older. And suddenly, 
Along came Easy Rider, and this whole new audience was exploited, and a whole new group of filmmakers and dreamers and vision makers were conceived. And so I was in a company where I was 26, right? And I was probably somewhere near 40 years younger than the average age of the other 55 white males that were in the company. Imagine. So I had time on my side. I knew if I just stayed there, good things could happen. When you read the book Synchronicity, you followed your intuition and let it lead you to another life. And in fact, you lived then in Washington for, for another, 17 years. 17 years. And then came back. May I say that when you came back, you noticed that other people got old that you had known <laughs> without you? I love that line. Well, the 17 years in Washington was wonderful. I was a U.S. diplomat. And I, I literally traveled and worked in every country of Latin America except Cuba. And I averaged three weeks in every country. And there, every place is people, yes. and people in need. And being able to help people is a gift from God. Yes, and that we're all connected. And no matter where you go, don't you find that basically we all want the same thing? No oh, matter yeah. what people our culture, are people. people are people. Mm -hmm. And all need the same things. But I want to ask you, what did you get from that book, Synchronicity, that moved you so? It's been years since I read it. It was just, it actually was reinforcing my beliefs. And was, it, it just increased my comfort level. It made me feel a little less crazy, a little less dairy. <laughs> what was the one defining moment of your life? Very easy, very easy, I think. When I was the rehearsal pianist, Yes. On Funny Girl, yes, which was starring Barbara Streisand. I was about 24, 25 ah. years old. And she had her own pianist. Uh -huh. So basically I hardly ever played for her. Mm -hmm. I would play if there were a chorus people and her. Then right. all of a sudden it was, goes to my bailwack. Right. Okay. Her pianist gets a call on a Friday night to play a party. And he says, I'm not playing a party, but I'll give you Marvin Hamlish. Talk to him. Oh, you're kidding. I now get a phone call from a woman. She says she needs a piano player. I say, I don't play parties. I you know, work with Barbara Streisand. I'm good. I said, but if you tell me who the party's for, <laughs> perhaps I can send you someone. Uh -huh. She said it was for the uh, Hollywood producer, Sam Spiegel, who had just done On the Waterfront oh and Lawrence of Arabia. Oh, my. And I said, I'll, I'll, be, over. I'll be over in 10 minutes. <laughs> right. And I went over, played the party, knew knew in my head that this could be a my moment. moment. I mean, it's not every day you get a chance to play for Sam Spiegel, a man who makes motion pictures. Amazing. The end of the thing, he says to me, he's looking for a new composer for a film. The next thing you know, eight months later, I'm in Hollywood. I know there's such a spiritual component to your work. Uh, you know, uh, I've seen what's, what, what you might call miracles. Yes. And, uh, and the only explanation I have for miracles is that there is another superior uh, being that's, that's making those kind of decisions. Yes. So you, you can't help but escape that, that, that feeling, you know, from all the experience that you've had clinically. I think Einstein said the more he knew about science, that's right. the more he believed he sure in God. Did. And, you know, the interesting thing is he... Uh, he, had, he died of a ruptured aneurysm of the abdominal aorta. Oh. And his doctors called me and asked me if I would bring a graph and come up there. For heaven's sake. Uh, to operate on him. And I said, of course I would. He said, well, we haven't got his, his permission yet, so wait until I call you back. So they called me back a little later that afternoon and said he re still refused to be operated on. He, he, he just first said, if it's time for me to go, it's time for me to go. It is so great having the two of you here today. Oh. I am overwhelmed. I'm so excited. And, and I'm, I know you both so well. That's what's really great. <laughs> but I want you to tell your story. And I'll start with Ernie. How did you meet this gorgeous, brilliant woman over here? Tell. Oh, let's see. How much do I owe you for all this? <laughs> let's tell the story of how you both got together. How you met. She had come over uh, doing something here in Los Angeles. And uh, Marty Allen, the whole bushy-haired comic, yes. you know, and his wife, Frenchie, who had since passed away, God bless her, uh, they invited me to the birthday party, Marty Allen's birthday yes. party. 
And I said, uh, they said, you got to bring a girl. I said, no, <laughs> forget it. I said, I'm through with women. I'm even thinking of taking up with men. <laughs> I said, no, no, wait a minute. We know a girl that you can bring, and she's staying at the hotel over there because she's here for a couple of three hours. And bring her. You bring her. You find her. I said, okay, Marty, as a favor to you, I'll do it. So in comes this redhead. Gorgeous redhead. And I looked at this girl, and I, I looked again, and she said, hello, hello, I'm Tova, and so on, so on, so on. I said, oh, then this is the girl that I'm supposed to date. And she came over and sat down, and we started talking, and we're still talking. Yeah. Yes. 32 <laughs> years 32, later. No, actually, 33 33 years in March. Oh, well, 33 33 years years. knowing each other. (laughs) But 32 years married. married. See the world right now in an apocalyptic moment. The world is in the apocalypse, but the apocalypse is not what everybody believes it to be, a terminal situation. It is actually... A force for change. It's a birth process. And in the mystical process, which I partly been through, you go through what is called a dark night of the soul in Uh which you lose all your moorings and you're stripped of all of your certainties and all your illusions are shattered and you suffer horribly. But if you know what's happening, you know that this suffering is not the end. It is actually the preparation for a wholly new level of consciousness. The world is now going through a communal dark night of the soul, what I call the dark night of the species. Yes. It is that I believe the divine is a presenting a mirror to humanity when it gets humanity's attention and I think humanity yes. is now listening because yes. terrible crisis makes you listen mm. the divine turns the mirror to the right and the mirror goes dark and a seven-headed beast of the apocalypse appears in it which we all have to look at and very simply those seven heads are the following a terrible busyness an appalling hectic busyness and anxiety which prevent people from really getting to the core of their divine knowledge and their divine nature. And if you combine that, a population explosion with a environmental holocaust, with fundamentalism, with weapons of mass destruction, with the addiction to technology, with mass media that trivializes everything, and the, this busyness that prevents self-recognition at the deepest level. No you contemplation. Have no contemplation, no peace of mind. Yes. You have the recipe for what's going on. Right. But once the divine has really forced you to look at that and really got your attention, then the divine will smile and the mirror will turn. And you'll see what I call the golden mirror, which my life has been dedicated to staring into. Yes. I'm Dr. Gail Gross. My guest has been linked to some of the biggest success stories in the television business. Oprah, Dr. Phil, Wheel of Fortune, Jeopardy, and Inside Edition are just a few of the shows that King World has introduced to the American public. They are true behind-the-scenes King makers whose company finds and distributes some of the best shows on the air today. Richie King, welcome. Thank you. Tell us how, what is the story of King World? How did it get started? Uh, The story of King World, by the way, let me just say that uh, I have never done a television interview. I've been in television all my life. Uh, I I did it because I trust you, I love your work, Uh, and you're a great lady. So I'd like to start there. Thank you. Thank you. King World is a a fascinating American success story. Uh, My mother, uh, Lucille King and Charles King, had six children. My father was in the radio business. My mother just uh, wanted to be a housewife, a mother. Uh, Probably one of the most beautiful things I ever heard my mother ever say was that uh, she never would have changed one day of her life, that she loved being a mother and a husband, a wife, and uh, that, that's something that most people can't say today with a high instance really? of, of divorce and a personal ambition. Her personal ambition was to be a mother, a mentor, and uh, a, you know, a wife, and uh, she did it great. I my father that. started in radio in the 40s with, uh, he had uh, Gangbusters and uh, the Gloria Swanson show and Rudy Valley, and he was a real big second honeymoon, a queen for a day. Then uh, television came along and, and knocked my father out of business, and he wouldn't 
declare bankruptcy, paid everybody 100 cents on the dollar, so he had to go into television. Yes. <laughs> and he was one of the pioneers in TV. Amazing. With local television shows, and, uh, and he was one of the first syndicators that is our business, King World is a syndication company. And we, uh, he, he was in the forerunner of that business that just started. How did you find your way to His Holiness, the Dalai Lama? Well, he was the sort of, you know, most important person, and it was hard to see him. But once I learned the language very much, I was kind of a phenomenon amongst the Tibetans, the first sort of white person who really spoke well. And um, because of my interest in the Dharma, you know, and yoga, and my knowledge of language, then I pretty easily got to meet uh, His Holiness. He wasn't so busy like he is now. Yeah. And he was much younger. He was only five years, six years older than me. And uh, we just immediately hit it off, you know. And I would ask him questions about Buddhism, and he would ask me questions about America, about New York, about Washington, about democracy, about philosophy, whatever it was, science, yeah. you know, humanities, literature, history, every subject you can think of. And then you decided to become a monk. Then, yeah, that what was, a decision. I know. Well, basically, not such a huge decision in Tibetan culture. In Tibetan culture, being a monk is sort of like getting a lifelong MacArthur Fellowship. Yeah. You just get grant, people take care of you, you study, you meditate, you do what you want to do. And, and you, you're just, you know, n nourished in the center the of culture. the society by yes. the culture. And so I was temporarily in that refugee bubble of the, you know, in Dharmsala, of the mini Tibetan culture. And I was sure I was going to spend my life at it. Now, my old teacher, the old Mongolian who had also helped me, he said, you shouldn't do that because you won't stay. He told even his holiness, he said, he's very smart and he's this and that, he has a good mind, but he, doesn't, he won't really last as a monk. Yeah. <clears throat> so then his holiness was also just fresh out of Tibet. Yes. And for him, again, it was the most natural, and it wasn't such a big sacrifice or hard thing. Mm -hmm. So he more or less, after a year or so, he ordained me. Yes. And then I did resign after three or four years, and uh, he was a little bit disappointed, I can say. Yes. Because you were very young, mm -hmm. and India was such a foreign kind of environment. I mean, not just somewhere else, but Eastern in philosophy, so totally different from the West. And I think you two met on that adventure. Daniel, <laughs> tell us about your your moment that brought you to India. And to Sharon. And to Sharon. <laughs> uh, actually, like Sharon, I started to get interested in meditation during my college years. Uh, but um, perhaps for slightly different reasons. I was feeling very pressured, really hassled, really anxious about things. Yes. And along came an opportunity to learn to meditate. Like many people in those years, my first uh, meditation was uh, TM. Yes. And what I found was very interesting to me because I realized that if I would meditate in the morning 20 minutes and the evening 20 minutes, I felt more relaxed. I felt more alert. I, I was enjoying things more. And uh, because I was studying psychology, I, I was interested in this professionally, too, because I yes. realized that meditation was psychoactive. It was like Prozac, in one sense, at least what, what I was doing then. I went to Bodh Gaya, India, which is where Buddha was enlightened. Yes. And uh, went to a course in Vipassana, it's called, which means mindfulness meditation. And uh, one of the people who was there was Sharon. Here, here. So we've known each other <laughs> for quite a while. What gave you all the ideas that you could do it? You know, in a man's world where mm. men are, you know, in their own sort of club, how did you all break in? And it how never did you occur to me that I couldn't? Mm. That's mm -hmm. interesting. I think because I was on television when I was a child. I know you were mm -hmm. a horn and hard art. Children's hour. Children's yeah. I watched days you of television. <laughs> and I couldn't sing and I couldn't dance, but I could talk. <laughs> so I think that that gave me confidence. Yes. Lynn, how about you? I mean, psychology, Rollo May, I mean, it had to be just. Well, it was a very interesting period during the 70s. And um, there was a real a spiritual awakening and kind of an aliveness. You know, women were finding their own you know place in the world, and and there was just a lot of, of new a lot of new ideas, a lot of uh, you know new ways of thinking. And so I got caught up in that, and and it's just carried over into my adult life. And you, how did you? Well, I can say exactly. exactly. I can to what you just said about um, learning. You know how to be 
your own person at such a young age being given the opportunity to be on television. I was a child actress. So you were. You were. And I won an award. <laughs> I won an award in Canada for the best actor or actress under the age of 16 for the whole country. Come wow. on. And I, that moment in time probably saved my life because I was on stage being given this trophy, being seen in a way that, you know, it took me so much to hold up to that after that. But I mm. felt... I found myself, and I, I knew that I could do it. And that, that stayed with me all through the years. What uh, kind of advice would you give young people interested in entering the political life today when there's so much character assassination, so many families are devastated by their uh, family member running for office. Yeah. It's, it's amazing, it's really. Ugly. It is ugly. Really, it is really ugly, and you have to be, as I said earlier, you have to have a hard shell. Yes. You have to understand that politics ain't beanbag. <laughs> you have to understand that it's not a spectator sport. Mm -hmm. It's a blood sport. Yes. But it is, after all, our system. And, uh, and, and the last thing I would say to people thinking about whether they ought to get into politics or not is do it. It's the way you participate in the governance of a country that's been extraordinarily f generous to all of us. I mean, everybody in the world wants to come to America. They want to come to America because we are the most successful political exper experiment and the most successful economic experiment the world has ever yes. seen. Are we perfect? Heck no. That's why only 51 plus or percent or so vote in our elections. Exactly. But. But, uh, you know, who was it said, maybe it was Churchill said, democracy is messy, uh, but it's better than any other, al but better than any alternative. alternative system. If you want to be in public service, you better be willing to participate in the corollary of public service, which is politics. Right. That's uh, with, with that I, J. William Fulbright, I think it was a senator who said, uh, if you want to be a statesman, you first have to get elected. What is the defining moment of your life? Getting married to the right woman 46 years ago. Um, being told by a college football coach that yes, I could play pro football if I worked harder and studied more. Um, going into politics, when everybody said I couldn't go from the football field into Congress, uh, I went out and tried it. and I, that, So I've had several defining moments, excuse me for elaborating, but I really did. Yes. I really have had several defining moments in my life, all of which are associated with giving me the confidence and the faith in the future to never give up. And what do you think was that something inside of you? You know, we're, we're always talking about statesmen and how difficult it, it is to find a true statesman, and you are a true statesman. What is that? How did you get that? Well, yes. I was taught by my mother, who was a strong Republican, uh, an Eisenhower, you know, Dewey, uh, uh, Reagan Republican, um, that I could disagree with somebody without being disagreeable. And uh, that I, uh, I was brought up in a liberal home, yes. a li small L, classical liberal home, where art, music, books, debate, discussion, the mind. Mm -hmm. Well, my mother encouraged her four sons and my three brothers and me, A, to never give up, and B, to respect people, respect all religions, respect all people, uh, and get to know their culture, their religion, their hopes, their fears, their dreams and aspirations. I think that really was uh, what defined our home and has helped define my view towards the rest of the world. In your first book, Stress Died in Your Heart, you put stress first because you, as a medical doctor, realized and then put into your program stress reduction techniques, realizing that actually that you can have a healthy heart and have a heart attack. There's no question about that. The mechanisms by which our mind can affect our heart and our health in general are becoming exquisitely much more well understood. Yes. But you know, the stress isn't so much what we do more importantly is how you react to what you do. Yes. 
Yes. But, the, but then the question is, why do some people react in ways that are stressful? And I think it comes back to, all, these are ultimately spiritual questions. Because mm -hmm. what these spiritual practices do, meditation and yoga and so on, is not just about managing or coping with stress. They give you the direct experience that on one level we are separate. You're you and I'm me. On another level, we're part of something larger that connects us. How can we come to a place in our culture where we actually can experience peace? When we have this inner peace, then whatever the outer circumstances may be, that you will, your basic being is not disturbed. Or to put it more simply, when he's on the is often asked by people, what is the art of happiness? How to be happy? <laughs> Could you say it in one sentence? Exactly. And I remember him always saying, you see, granted that external situations and circumstances do to a certain extent contribute to one's happiness, suffering, but fundamentally, happiness and suffering depend upon the mind and the heart, how it perceives through the five senses. Yes. So that's why, you see, Buddhism is about, Dalai Lama often says, not about mantras, not about even mes meditation, not even about visualization or yoga. It's about transforming the mind. Exactly. Because the mind or heart is the, we call it the universal ordering principle, is the creator of happiness. Welcome, Abby. Thank you, my beautiful Gail. Thanks for coming. Well, it's my pleasure. You know how much I adore you and admire you. Abby, how did this all begin? A ma an amazing career. Well... I was born in a trunk. <laughs> no, I <laughs> Judy know. Judy Garland's line. No. But you did start very young. Very young. I started at four professionally. Imagine. And uh, actually, I had to learn uh, lyrics to songs uh, of a, a, a short. They called yes. them shorts at that time. Yes. They did in between films. Interesting. She's going to date me back to no, 1900. No, no. <laughs> but uh, it was a way to ex show young talent. Yes. And then... Um, I had to learn the words spoken to me and then memorize the songs that way. Because wow. Because four, you're not exactly, exactly. fluent in, in reading. And it started singing and dancing in kiddie shows. And then my first Broadway show at 13 for George Abbott. Wow. And I lied about my age. Of course. But so gorgeous they let you. Well, <laughs> yeah. I'd already started to look kind of like a, a woman. Yes. Um, I helped matters along by wearing high heels. And, yes. You know, Great legs. To be very, and then I went on to do three other Broadway shows. Imagine. And finally, uh, at 15, I was in a show for Michael Todd. And Elizabeth Taylor. She was married to him at Imagine. that time. Imagine. And um, that was when I met my ex-husband. Ah. And if your listeners don't know, if they're too young, then don't watch.